surrounded by the world's highest mountains, is a fascinating world whose exotic charm enchants all who experience it. From the plains of West Bengal up into the Himalayas, Siliguri is a vibrant city located within India's Terai Plains. This peaceful provincial town with its calm streets and shops that once supplied the region's tea pickers with their daily needs has been transformed into an important crossroads for travelers to the Himalayas. Just a few kilometers away is a Hindu temple and the impressive Coronation Bridge. Monkeys sit at the roadside The huge stupa of the Salugara Monastery attracts attention. And in the Iskon Temple, Lord Krishna, who is said to have once hidden in the nearby jungle, is worshipped. Siliguri train station is the starting point of one of the most famous train journeys in the world. And the most splendid way to travel from Siliguri to Darjeeling is by way of the Darjeeling Himalaya toy train. The narrow gauge train leaves on time and after a short while stops in Sukhna. This is the last village in the plains before the train enters the jungle. It's still hot and humid, a situation that will soon change. We climb the hill. For most of the time, the single track rails run parallel with the road. This section contains several bends. There's much change of altitude and the journey lasts for 10 hours. British engineering made this pioneering work possible. An 88 kilometer railroad connection to the mountain world of the Himalayas. And zigzag tracks help overcome steeply rising terrain. With frequent stops in small villages. The train climbs to an altitude of more than 2,000 meters, negotiates 873 bends, and crosses 554 bridges. Ko Siong lies at an altitude of 4,864 feet above sea level a hill town once used by the British as a summer retreat. The train continues at slow pace, ranging between walking speed and 10 kilometers per hour. Many stops and many sights. The train has the right of way We arrive at Sonada Station. In this region settled Bhutia, Tibetans, Lepcha and Nepalese. A unique mixture of mountain people that is a fine example of those who have learned to live together in harmony. The ride goes higher and even closer to the local traffic. Finally, Goom, the highest point. monastery and attractive buildings and lanes, the people here earn their living from tea plantations. From here, the train makes its descent to Darjeeling, and each bend takes us closer to that most famous destination of our journey, Darjeeling. Our final destination, from the scorching Siliguri and the lowlands up to the cool mountains at more than 6,890 feet. A bustling cosmopolitan place. In 1814, when the East India Company arrived here and began to cultivate tea plantations, around 200 people lived on the tree-lined slopes. 
There have been tea plantations here since 1840. This splendid tea growing area has a favorable geographical and climatic location and produces some of the best teas in the world. General Lloyd discovered this area and within this small cemetery was eventually laid to rest. We leave Darjeeling and head towards Sikkim. Before we reach the last major city in northwest Bengal, we visit a famous monastery. The 300-year-old Sangjan Dorjai Monastery near Pedong is part of the Drukpa teaching tradition. In the region's oldest monastery, the mummified remains of the Bhutanese Shapdrang Rinpoche are worshipped. A tour gives a good insight into its history and culture. At first glance, Kalimpong is not exactly inviting. Unlike Darjeeling, it's never been associated with tea, but is and always has been a trading center on the once busy route to Bhutan, Tibet, and Nepal. Kalimpong is a lively place. However, Deolo Hill, with its walking trails, beautiful plants, and magnificent views to the west of the city, is somewhat calmer. Sikkim, for centuries a segregated and independent Buddhist kingdom on the edge of the Himalayas. And since 1975, a small autonomous federal state of India. Historical, cultural and spiritual, Sikkim is strongly associated with Tibet and possesses more than 200 monasteries. The most holy monastery of the Nying Mapa schools is in Tashiding and is located on a mountain in the east of the country, along the route from Darjeeling. The monastery was built in 1717 following the site of a rainbow that connected the site with the majestic Kanchenjunga mountain. This large complex consists of a modern main temple, several buildings, chapels, and a chotan with relics of both Chogyals and Lamas. On the 15th day of the first month of the Tibetan calendar, followers from all over Sikkim come to Tashiding to celebrate the Nyingmapa Bumchu festival. The streets are narrow, steep and bumpy. But the land is fertile and cultivated by many workers. The sleepy village of Yoksum is located on a large plateau. In 1642, three lamas met here. They came from various parts of the Himalayas in order to appoint a religious leader. In Norbolang Chotan, numerous offerings were made. The building is thought to have been constructed of stone and earth from various regions of the country. The stone throne of the first Chogyal and a stone footprint are also worshipped here.
On the northern edge of the village is the sacred Katok Lake, whose water is often used for religious ceremonies. Along the lake shore are many Buddhist prayer flags erected by the faithful who hope their wishes will be answered by the gods. Yoksum is also the starting point of the Zhongri Trail, one of the few trekking routes that's also available to outsiders. Experienced guides routinely stow baggage on the back of the yak. And now we begin the demanding several days ascent towards Kanchenjunga. A romantic forest trail leads to the Dubdi Monastery that was built high above Yoksum in a spectacular location in 1701. Two prayer houses and three stupas are situated in the fenced garden terrain. It's one of the oldest monastery complexes that is no longer inhabited by monks. Religious texts are stored in these houses of worship, and saints and demons survey the scene. A place of pilgrimage, 1,700 meters above sea level. Again and again, bridges cross huge canyons with wild, rushing mountain streams. Frighteningly narrow routes lead further up into the mountains. At 2,000 meters, the Kechiopalri Monastery, along the route to a magic lake. Initially, only a forest of prayer flags can be seen. And next, a long footbridge and small lake, another sacred place. According to legend, the leaves that fall upon the surface of the lake are collected by a bird so the purity of the water is assured. Our journey travels through various villages and street markets. Around 75% of the population are Nepalese girlings. Lepchas, the former rulers, form about 20% and the remainder are Bhutias. Soon we reach Pelling, a peaceful, fast-growing city, which is about 2,085 meters above sea level and now a popular tourist destination. Buildings, including hotels, overlook the Kanchenjunga and are situated high up the steep slopes. buildings have been built according to traditional design. Indian holidaymakers have discovered this mountain resort. From Pelling, a strenuous but scenic path leads up to the final hill, to the Sangar Chuling Monastery. Mostly shrouded by dense fog, this, the oldest of Sikkim's monasteries, is full of mystique. As is the interior of the prayer house. The monastery was destroyed by fire and rebuilt in 1948. The original monastery was built by Latsan Chenpo, and its name means the Island of Esoteric Doctrine. A worthy description. However, just two kilometers from Pelling, another impressive monastery is perched at the end of a ridge high above the Rangit River, Pemayangtsi Gompa.
This was also founded in the 17th century by Latsun Chenpo and belongs to the Nyingmapa order. Each new year at the Losa celebration, a Guru Drogmacham is performed here. Gaizin is one of the largest meeting places. On market day, the small main square and adjacent streets are occupied mainly by farmers who offer freshly harvested fruit and vegetables. The produce is weighed and the price bargained for. A colorful activity full of excitement and color. Here the origin of the name Sikkim becomes clear. Sukim means happy home. After the first Shogyal resided in Yoksam, his son, King Tensang Namgyal, moved the capital to Rabdense. The rule of a secular and religious leader of Sikkim was soon recognized by Tibet and its territory extended far beyond the borders of today. Hostilities by the Nepalese army destroyed the capital and only the ruins of the palace have survived. The farmhouses all have the same design and construction with thatched roofs and mud walls replaced by corrugated iron and cement. Warm hospitality is part of the lifestyle of the people. They live simply, but not in poverty. Their work can be seen everywhere. Dangerous and winding roads lead through the rugged wilderness of the Himalayas. Near the small town of Kwezing is the Bone Monastery of the same name. It was built in the last decade of the 19th century by under the rule of Tutob Namgyal. The history of the Bon faith, which originated in Tibet, dates back to the 9th century. Different from Buddhism, the Holy King was at its center. The relationship between shamanism and nature has been preserved right up to the present day. And fortune telling is also part of the Bon religion. Due to a funeral, we experience a mangru gompa. It's a fascinating ceremony, with matching music and prayers, and the participation of the whole community. The few monks of the tiny monastery pray for the deceased. And the villagers receive food and drink. The gateway to West Sikkim is Legsip, an important traffic junction in the deep valley of the Rangit River. However, there's always a delay of a few hours before travelers are able to continue their journey. Scattered over a mountain pass is the rather sleepy market town of Ravangla, 65 kilometers from the capital. There's a vegetable market and several shops, and people come from the entire region to do their shopping here.
Many vehicles are parked along the main street, essential transport for those who come here to shop. A well-organized system that is very effective even in this remote area. Ravangla is home to a large Tibetan community that has introduced an arts and crafts center with carpet weaving. Here, the tradition is passed on and sales provide a living for the people. The detour to Ralong is a bumpy journey along a hazardous road. During stormy weather, sections of the road often break away and crash into the steep abyss below. But it's a worthwhile adventure. The Ralong Monastery and its young student monks gives a warm welcome to visitors. The oldest monastery in Kagyupa is a splendid sight. After the fourth Chogyal returned from a pilgrimage, he planted seeds of cereal from the Tsurfu Monastery in Tibet and had a monastery built. One hundred monks reside here in a new building, the Palchen Chuling Monastic Institute. In the 11th century, the Kagyupa school of Buddhism was disseminated by the Mapa from Tibet. The basis of the teachings were tantric and magical exercises. So the reality of wisdom, enlightenment, veneration and emptiness are deemed to be identical. The narrow road continues. It travels past tea plantations on whose slopes are planted endless rows of tea bushes. Sikkim is India's most northerly region. The black first flush from the Temi tea garden is considered to be a royal tea, with a subtle, sweet, elegant and harmonious taste. The plantation was established in 1969 and today Sikkim tea competes with that of Darjeeling despite their obvious differences. Our journey passes through small mountain towns and picturesque villages. Rural life and well-worked landscape terraces. Here, despite the altitude, rice is grown. Sikkim is rightly known as Bemul Denjong, Hidden Valley of Rice. Finally, we reach the old Ramtek Monastery, in which the 16th Kamapa resides. In 1959, following invasion by the Chinese, Rangyong Rigby Doje fled from Tibet. But within a few years, the Kamapa had begun to build a new monastery on land gifted by the king of Sikkim, Shogyal Tashi Namgyal. Rumtek Gompa is the head office of the Kama Kagyu school that was founded by Gwalia Kamapa Dusan Kiapa near to Lhasa in the 12th century. The Black Hats cult has great influence and has spread Tibetan Buddhism to the west, but the monastery continues to be protected from its various enemies. Oh. 
Near Gangtok is the Lingdom Monastery, which was founded by Gawang Rinpoche, who is believed to be the 12th incarnation of Zuman Gawang. It is a monastery of typical Tibetan design with brightly painted columns and external walls, and gallery corridors in front of the monks' living quarters. Life in the monasteries was often hard and full of privation. And due to a shortage of young people, many families had to send at least one son to the monastery. Only a few were suited to demanding philosophical study. And so the monks were divided into various lower divisions of monastic service. Major changes in monastic life began during the revival of the monasteries in the late 1970s. But its deep faith has been preserved. Gangtok, a multicultural capital, extends along a mountainside at an altitude of 1,870 meters and was once located on a busy trading route to Tibet. Here, Buddhism has survived despite its transformation to a modern city. And the Enchi Monastery is popular with the local people. The monastery was built on a site blessed by Drupdob Kapo. From Ganesh Toktar, there's a fine view of the city, which, due to the altitude, is usually covered by cloud. Although its hillside location leaves little space for streets and buildings, there is a small park and fountain. The flower show complex features an extensive collection of orchids and various mountain plants. And seeds and bulbs can be purchased here. The imposing whitewashed Dodrul Chotan is a reminder of Guru Rinpoche, who hid precious texts in Sikkim. Contemporary life has not affected Gangtok, and its traffic is well organized. The small buildings and streets are clean and well maintained. Football's popular, so a stadium was built on the hillside. And the pedestrian zone of Ming Mar, with shops, restaurants and small cafes, makes it easy to forget the city's remote location at the foot of the mountains. Tradition, spirituality, culture and handicrafts, ethnic diversity and rural life, all combined with both myth and legend. Sikkim is a jewel on the edge of the Himalayas. The independent kingdom of Bhutan is located in Southeast Asia, most of it being 2,000 meters above sea level and situated between India in the south and Tibet in the north. The land of the thundering dragon, high up between the peaks of the Himalayas. The journey from Sikkim lasts several hours on the often narrow and dangerous road. Timpu is the capital of this fascinating country, 2,300 meters above sea level, and it's a challenging place to travel to. A large gate and a stupa welcome visitors. Until the 1960s, Bhutan was protected from intruders due to its geographical location and was totally cut off from the outside world.
Timpu is not a typical capital city. Here, Buddhism dominates all. This, the Changanka Temple. One of the oldest Lakangs in Timpu Valley, built in the 15th century by a descendant of the founder of the Drukpa school. The temple was renovated at the end of the 20th century. And is visited by many families. The town is mainly inhabited by the state clergy, the royal family, members of the government, various officials, and a constantly changing middle class. Today, the traffic is increasing, but it's still bearable. In Bhutan, building styles are strictly adhered to. By royal decree, the buildings must reflect traditional design. On the northern edge of the city, on the banks of the Wang River, is the Pangri Zampa Temple. Two impressive white buildings in the center of a monastery. After his arrival in Bhutan in 1616, Shamdrug Nawang Namgyal lived here, when the temple appeared to him in a vision. Today, a monastic school of astrology is located behind an unusually long prayer wall of carved stones, surrounded by a forest of cypress trees. An array of prayer flags adorns the bridge in the center of Timpu. It's a fascinating sight. From here, it's not far to the large Shon Kang Marketplace, a colorful meeting place for both farmers and traders. There's a fine display of vegetables, fruit, spices, and all kinds of goods. Halfway up a built-up slope is the Choten Memorial that was built in 1974. This impressive monument with its golden top was built in honor of the late third king, but contains only a photo. It was commemorated by his mother. The main building is the Fortress of Auspicious Religion, the Tasicho Jong, built at the command of Shabdrung. Since 1641, it has been the summer residence of both king and clergy, and is also the seat of government. South of Timpu, where the streets to Paro and Bunaka diverge, Semtokajong is located in a strategic position, a typical Bhutanese fortress. The sturdy sloping walls of the Palace of Profound Tantric Teachings were designed to ward off attack by five groups of lamas in 1634. In its infancy, Bhutan was a Hindu feudal principality up until the 8th century when Indian missionaries introduced Buddhism. Curved, narrow streets and steep slopes are typical of Bhutan. The road to Punaka travels across the Dochula Pass, from the top of which 108 Chotans appear in the mist. 
shorten are containers for religious offerings that symbolize Buddha's consciousness in the Himalayan countries and are therefore sacred. As quickly as it arrives, the fog vanishes and the Druk Wangyali Hakang temple suddenly appears out of nowhere on a nearby hill. It's believed that it took as its inspiration the model of Zando Pelri, the copper palace of Guru Rinpoche. In memory of the holy deeds and gestures of the fourth king. The route leads down to the next valley from 3,050 meters. One time, the river valleys and narrow mountain tracks could only be traveled with pack animals. Again and again, we pass small villages whose well-preserved farmhouses seem to cling precariously to the slopes. The center of the village contains a small shop. Occasionally, minibuses pass by and Chortons continue to protect against demons. It's around two hours drive from Timpu to the next slightly larger settlement. Lobesa is situated on a crossroad that leads to Punaka and Wangdu Fodrang. The village is developing quite quickly and a number of attractive buildings and eating places vie with a street market. Here the region's farmers do their shopping and vehicles stop to load large quantities of goods. We take the only road to Punaka. Soon the Purachang River appears and groups of monks hurry along in the same direction. Punaka, a larger village whose main building is a monastery castle that is strategically located at the meeting of two rivers. Punaka Zhong was Bhutan's winter capital for over 300 years. Guru Rinpoche blessed this place and predicted the construction of a fortress here. In 1637, Shabdrung came here and set up camp. That same night, he had a prophetic dream. So he decided to build a Zhong here and to store within it a most sacred relic which he had brought from his monastery in Tibet. It was the Avalokiteshvara statue that had miraculously appeared from nowhere. The Tibetans wanted it back and duly attacked but the Bhutanese defended it successfully, an event that is celebrated each year. During the three-day celebration, thousands of people populate the large courtyard in order to experience religious processions and ritual dances. Masked monks play gods, and guardian deities are depicted in the temple as paintings and sculptures. Entertaining clowns amuse the audience, along with women's singing groups. Scenes of the daily life of the Bhutanese are portrayed in dance, in fields, and during a hunt the gods are always close by. Several mystery dancers recall the deeds of the mighty Shabdrong who led the Drukpa school in the 17th century. A monk who characterizes Shabdong Rinpoche 
appears before the waiting crowd and the demons are yet again expelled. The result is the victory of the forces of good over evil. Religion is the basis of daily life here and sacred rites are treated with the utmost respect. The participation of the people in both song and dance creates a mystical mood and makes the monastery festival something really special. Bhutan is a peaceful country whose symbol is a dragon. In the 12th century, during construction of a Tibetan monastery, a roll of thunder was heard, a sound that was interpreted as the voice of a dragon. Bhutan is a country of fertile paddy fields and orchards, tiny colorful villages, deep wide valleys and snow-capped mountains. Agriculture is the main source of income of its people. Around 5,500 species of plants grow here, many of them containing medicinal properties. Mother Nature is worshipped, and culture and age-old traditions are well observed. Situated on a hill in the Punaka Valley and surrounded by paddy fields is the idyllic Chimilakhan. The temple is a place of pilgrimage for infertile women. A sacred tree and a forest of prayer flags surrounds the little Chimi monastery that was built on a plateau. It was founded by Ngawang Chogyal, the 14th heir of Ralun, in 1499. It's on the site of a stupa, previously built at the command of Lama Drukpa Konli. High above the Punachang River, and with a bridge checkpoint, the Wangdu Fodrangzhong dominates a majestic mountain ridge. To the founder of the empire, a deity who appeared in a dream predicted peace and that a fortified monastery would be built in the shape of a sleeping bull. Rearmost building just above the bridge is the oldest part of the fortress. Its secrets hidden to visitors. From here, the route leads back to Timpu Valley and then south. Three Chortons protect Chuzem against evil spirits. Where the Paro River meets the Timpu River, the road branches off. At first, Paro Valley is narrow, wild and barren. The small temple of Tibetan Saint Gyepo guards a strategic bend. There's no space for buildings and fields, only for the river and roads. But the valley gradually opens up and the first settlements appear. The hard-working farmers plough every available inch of earth with their oxen using primitive methods, but they're satisfied with their harvest. A bridge at the edge of the town and Paro is reached. The town settlement of Paro was founded in 1985 and has since developed rapidly along the river. Here too, the bridge in its center is decorated with colorful icons, prayer flags and paintings of numerous saints. Small towers guard steps to the bridge on both banks. And in the background, a fortress is visible. The former wooden bridge across the torrential river was retracted whenever danger threatened. 
The street which leads from Zhong is lined with a large square choton. Next, on the left, is the Druk Chuding Temple, which in 1525, the great-grandfather of Shabdung Namgyal built as a residence on his arrival at Paro Valley. A straight main street runs through the town, passing an old monastic tower, a square, and buildings of traditional design. At street level, there are many small shops that are typical of mountain villages. This is where the local people do their shopping. The route to Parozong travels along the valley to Dangsi Lakang, a small temple that is shaped like a Tibetan shorten. According to legend, a monster once lived here. A turtle with nine heads, which brought misfortune to all the people of the area. However, they managed to close up the cave in which the monster lived and built a temple above it. Here, the land is fertile. There are no monsters, and modern technology is slowly conquering the secluded valley. The fortified Paro Monastery is one of the most beautiful buildings in Bhutan. The mighty fortress once controlled the route by which the Tibetan armies repeatedly invaded. The Uchi, a central tower with a main temple stands in the middle of a courtyard and is surrounded by buildings, temples, monasteries and government offices. In the five-story buildings also live the governor of the valley and the monks. The lower section of the second courtyard is a cloistered area and is decorated accordingly. For more than a thousand years, this tiny kingdom has survived in self-imposed isolation, cut off from the outside world by its own deliberate policy. Above Paro, on a slope on the right-hand bank of the river, lies the Temple of the Ki River. According to legend, a giant female demon settled on the entire Himalayan region in order to prevent the spread of Buddhism. One hundred and eight temples were placed on each major part of her body. Thus, Kichu Lakang was built on her left foot. At the end of the valley, about 15 kilometers from Paro and located on a hill, is the once proud Drukyal Jong fortress. At its foot, the beautiful village of Tsento nestles against protective rocks and is surrounded by fertile fields which are brown or green according to the season of the year. Today, only ruins recall the heroic role of the fortified monastery during the Tibetan-Bhutanese War as a defense against the incursion of the Tibetans. Just off the only road in the Paro Valley, pack horses are waiting. From here begins an arduous descent to one of the most remote monasteries in the world. Various horses return to the valley, finally free of their burdens. From curve to curve, 
the Takchang Monastery comes into view, nestled in the steep rock. This, the tiger's nest, is world famous. Flags flutter in the cool breeze and prayer wheels rotate at 2,950 meters above sea level. We arrive at this holy place situated between heaven and earth. This amazing country has retained its ancient traditions, religious secrets and cultural identity. Tashi Delak. Goodbye, Bhutan.